Welcome to the Low Carb MD Podcast. No one is beyond help. No one is beyond hope. As we have always said, we are bringing you medical information and cutting edge science, but none of this is medical advice. Please seek out input from your own doctor. Hello and welcome back to the Low Carb MD Podcast. Tro, good to see you, man. Absolutely. It's finally good to be back. You know, uh, my parents are like my biggest fans. They're like, Tro, it's been a couple of weeks. You haven't talked to Brian. You yeah, know? it's been crazy. <laughs> huh? Yeah, we've been busy and trying to mix our schedules. Now we have a great guest, Tro. And man, it's good to be back. Miss you, man. Yeah, absolutely. This is going to be fun. Finally, they let you back on YouTube. So, you know, that's a that's a nice, you know, little thing. Listen, I, I'm excited today. Uh, we tried to get Dr. Anthony Bradley on several months back. There were some scheduling conflicts. Maybe he thought we were a little too kooky for him, but finally he decided to lower uh, his standards and come on our low carb MD podcast. I, I want to just briefly talk about um, who he is and maybe what piqued my interest. Um, he's a PhD in theology studies. He's a you know lecturer, author. Um, you've seen him on CNN, Fox News, and other places. And really what piqued my interest several months back was two things. One, his uh, interest in the apostolic religion, you know, kind of culture in Christianity. It's a little bit different than uh, some of the other, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, types of Christianity. And, and but more importantly, it was his interest in our young men, in their mental health, you know, their physical and spiritual health. Um and so I, and to boot, right, after all that, the guy's keto. So I'm like, well, the guy does look, he's a low carb believer. So I'm like, I have to get this guy on. So Dr. Bradley, you know, we're just so happy to have you here. And thanks for, uh, thanks for, you know, stooping down to our level. Not, not at all. I'm, I am, I am uh, humble, humble to be here. I am, I am not an expert. Of course, I'm not a physician. I'm a, I'm a doctor of, of thinking. And so I'm, I'm just delighted to, to be on the conversation. And by the way, just to, just to warn your uh, listeners, I live in New York city. I live in Washington Heights. I'm on 182nd street and it's loud. I live in a vibrant neighborhood. So if you hear um, a little reggaeton in the background or some kids screaming, I live across the street from a, a school or you, or, or if you hear sirens, I live right near the 34th precinct that's my my apologies in in advance. I am I am hot in the city in the city right now. I miss New York City. Listen, we're happy to have you here. So where should we start? You know, I think everybody will also always wants to hear a little bit about how people got to nutrition. And uh, you mentioned before we started that you're seeing in your colleges and as a high school teacher and now college professor. Um, that you're seeing some of the same things year after year play out in terms of mental health and physical health and nutrition. So how did you, how did you find keto? I mean, it's not the mainstream message, low carb is not the mainstream message, but I know that you're a proponent of it. So, you know, how do you go from, from, you know, being an author and an esteemed professor to, Hey, wait a second, you know, maybe I got to radically change my diet. Having a father with type two diabetes—that's that's a, that's, a, that's a wake up call, right? And and just sort of um, understanding the the dynamics of the data in the African American community. So a few years ago, this is probably this is probably 10, 12 years ago now. I just had my normal blood work, and my doctor told me that I was pre diabetic, and I'm like, I don't even know what that means. And he, and he showed that my A1C levels were elevated. And I didn't know what that meant. Uh, and so I called my dad. And then we had a new conversation and a relationship because we now we can now could talk about our, our A1C levels. Uh, he was diagnosed as, as type 2 years ago. It runs in the family. It's on, it's on his side and on my mom's side as, as well. So that was the beginning of, of me sort of thinking about my diet. And then he, the doctor immediately wanted to prescribe uh, metformin. And I'm like, wait, what? 
I am pre-diabetic, and you want me to already start taking pills. I'm thinking, this man is crazy. I'm not doing that. So I said, listen, there's got to be another way to lower my A1C levels without popping pills. I, I just, I was, I was just flabbergasted, but that was, that was his first response was to start taking pills rather than telling me, Hey, why don't you do some, some things differently about your diet, exercise, things like that to lower your A1C levels. And so that's when I began this journey of trying to figure out on my own how to get my A1C levels down. And because I was a biology major in college, I used to be a pharmaceutical chemist. I could read more of the technical data and, and try to learn some things. And on that journey, I began to explore, you know, different variations of, of uh, uh, having a, a low carb diet, trying to figure out, you know, do I eat three times a day or six times a day? Uh, do I do intermittent fasting or not? I mean, I sort of did a, a range of things. And so I had a season of, of my life on this journey where I was a pretty hardcore vegan. I mean, a hardcore vegan. Like our mayor. Exactly. Yeah. How did and, that work? and not only that, I mean, it was, there were a, a several periods in that, in that veganism. I was, I was a raw vegan. Right. And so what was so fascinating about that is I shredded a ton of weight. My A1C levels naturally plummeted. They were really, really low. And I thought, this is great, except for the fact that, A, the food was terrible. Uh, and then secondly, I was in the bathroom all the time because I wasn't right naturally digesting anything that I was consuming because your body doesn't break down uh, chloroform. Uh, and so, and so yeah. you know, and so all, all, that, all that fiber was just coming right out because it's, it's uh, nutritionally irrelevant. Uh, and so... I, as I did that for a while, I started to do some more research on B12 deficiency uh, with the vegan diet. And that's when I started to get a little bit more worried about, about that because of the, the correlations with, with B12 and dementia and, and Alzheimer's. And that's when I thought, okay, well, maybe this isn't going to work out. And a buddy of mine who was ahead of me on this journey introduced me, I believe, first to uh, Paul Saladino and then... Uh, Ken Berry, and that sort of uh, op opened me up. And then I just started to do the research myself. And I read and read and read and read and read. And then I realized... <gasps> what did you read? What did you read? So you, so, and, and where did you find Ken Berry? And was it on YouTube? Was it on... Where did you find these people? Yeah, so I think I, think I first found Saladino uh, from a, a buddy of mine, uh, Rob Fawcett, who's a, a pastor of a, a church in, in Alabama, and he suggested that I rec that I read some of his stuff. And I th actually, I, th I think he might have recommended that I I watch some YouTube videos. I can't remember. It was it was one of those those two things. But but this was right when the pandemic started, and so I had tons of time. I'm at home. My school's basically virtual. So I thought, well, listen, I'm at a I'm at at home all day. I should just give it a try. I'm going to see what it's going to be like if I just do hardcore carnivore. So I went right from being a vegan to switching to being a hardcore carnivore. And, and, and it was, it was great. You know, what was so awesome about it? The food tastes better. It was great. It was it was phenomenal because one of the things that I, I realized in the vegan community uh, is that is that uh, what was what would often happen is you would eat at a restaurant that was vegan and you would sort of say like oh man this food tastes really good and it and it kind of did but it actually didn't it was sort of you sort of told yourself that it, that it tasted good but it, it really didn't but I remember when I when I when I sort of after reading Salino and seeing some videos of him and Ken Berry and, and some other folks, I was reintroduced to the fact that, A, you could manage your health very well and still eat delicious foods and not snack. And that was crucial because being at home during the pandemic, I was, I was, I was just amazed at the fact that I could eat 
I remember the first time I did this, I had, I had a steak for lunch. And I was confused because I wasn't hungry for like the rest of the day. And I thought, is this how this works? <laughs> um, and so I just kind of had this, this personal revelation of an experiment uh, during the, the, the pandemic that, that really made everything else make a lot of sense. And so when I went back and had my blood work done again, I saw that my, my A1C levels were just as low as they were when I was on the vegan diet. And I thought, well, I guess I'll just do this now. And, and once I realized that you could, you could still manage your uh, blood sugar levels fairly well, remain lean. I introduced intermittent fasting as well uh, by, by having not just strictly a carnivore diet, but a low carb diet. Because even, even Saladino sort of moved away from that strictly carnivore diet as well. I just thought, well, I guess this is this is the new normal. It's not it's not a diet, quote unquote, right? It's not like a lifestyle. Uh, this is just a way for me to uh, manage my 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 health and and hopefully not end up in the same position that so many of my family members uh, did before me, who by the way didn't know any better. They didn't they didn't realize that eating you know uh, lots of of carbs and and sugar and seed oils and things like that were contributing to their uh, negative health outcomes. But we've got so much more data and information now that it really it it really I think puts it's more the responsibility on us to make better, better decisions. So that was, that was sort of how I, how I got there. And Dr. Bradley, how many, how long was it that you were doing the, the vegan raw vegan approach or the vegan approach before you switched over? And other than the GI stuff and concerns about B12, was there anything else you were noticing that said, oh, I got to make it switch? That's a great question. So it was, it was just over a year uh, of, of, of doing that. And, you know, I was, I was really, surprise i was having sleeping problems uh which was which was pretty pretty consistent there was all sorts of mental fog brain fog um that i was ex uh, that i was experiencing there I, I i i didn't like the fact that i was eating constantly just consuming so much food that i felt bloated uh all the time. There was some, I, I did feel quite lethargic as well. And I, I was not uh, just my sort of daily rhythm, my daily sort of circadian rhythm as, as well. I was, I just felt off. And, and I, I mean, I did it because I was in a community of people who were doing this. And so that just makes it a lot easier. You know, I, w I wouldn't say that, that I was, you know, I, I don't, I don't, I don't regret it because I, I needed to just experience it to see, see what it was like. But it, it certainly began to raise some, some questions uh, when I began to see some of the, the things that, that just felt, I guess, for lack of better uh, terms, just weird. But yeah, I, the, oh. you know, the, the brain fog, the, the not, not sleeping uh, well. Uh, being tired all the time, things like that really began to raise some 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 questions. Yeah, it sounds like you're hungry all the time and not feeling satiety and all that. But how did your family respond when you go, okay, I'm vegan, now I'm carnivore? Like, was did your family, friends, did anyone say, what in the world is, what's going on with you type thing? Because that's well, a huge sort of, transition. No, that's, that's a good question. It's sort of like, so what's he doing, you know, this Christmas, right? <laughs> you know, um, and I, I think I think one of the things I've, I've been I've been careful about is to not be overly uh, dogmatic about about this when I'm when when I'm in somebody else's home or when I'm with my parents, especially. I mean, they're kind of both in their early 80s, and so I mean they've made adjustments just because of my my dad's uh, diagnosis. But I just have sort of I just sort of tiptoe around the kitchen and eat some things and leave other things. And my mom, as we say in the South, bless her heart. I'm, I'm from Atlanta originally. Bless her heart. You know, she was raised in an era where you had to eat a meat, a vegetable and a starch. That's what they call it back in the South, a starch. And she just physically can't do it. I'm like, Ma. You don't need the bread. She's like, you got to have bread with dinner. I'm like, Ma, you don't. You really don't. She's like, you do. I'm like, Ma, you don't need the bread. 
You don't need the 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 mashed potatoes. You don't need it. She's like, I know, but you just can't have a meal without starch. I'm like, Ma, you can. Look, just try it. Just eat the veggies and the meat. She's like, I can't do it. I can't do it. I eat bread. So, you know, we sort of have this this banter going back and forth. But, you know, I just sort of selectively don't eat certain things. And when I was sort of in the vegan era, you know, uh, season, I just ate all the veggies and all the carbs. And people didn't really notice uh, uh, so much. And even even now, if I avoid the, the carbs, uh, people don't really notice because I am going to eat the steak and the ribs and things like that. So that, it wasn't it wasn't that big of a deal. I mean, I have had friends who sort of go back militant and they really are offensive to people. And I've, I've really tried not to not to be that way. Yeah, that's a huge point. Sorry, Troy, but that's a huge point because so many people are militant, like they go in and they'll fight with their friends. You, you know how many calories are in that? You know how much sugar is in that? Hey, let the people do what they want to do. If they ask your opinion, you can give it to them. But, you know, most of the time, just leave people alone and, and you know, do what you're doing and say, I'll pick this and this. And then people say, why don't you eat the bread? Well, that's just my stomach or I have diabetes or pre-diabetes. And, you know, usually people let it go. But sometimes, you know, it, it, it's one of those things. No one wants to be preached at when they're not ready to hear it. Well, I mean, it's a, it's a journey, right? I mean, it's not it's not just a, a one time decision. I mean, people have to be sort of deprogrammed to rethink about food differently. I mean, we were raised in a, in a, in a society that gave us that food pyramid and, and, and almost guilted us if we didn't properly fulfill it. Right. And I think it's just going to take a while for people to be open to the fact that, that, that pyramid, which by the way, a lot of people don't know this, that entire FDA pyramid was given to us by the seventh day at Venice church. Right. That diet, that diet is not a medical diet. Right. That food pyramid, those portions on that plate now, that's the Seventh day Adventist diet. And you can look this up. And I, I can't I can't remember when I found this out a couple of years ago. And I almost passed out because I thought, what happened to the, this this whole notion of the separation of church and state? Uh, but here we are. Here we are. Here we are with the Seventh day Adventist having that much influence on our food policy. And I thought, how do they, how do they do that? I, mean, I, I, I was really quite astonished at how successful they were at, at, at doing that. And so, and so people have, have been, really been conditioned and habituated to thinking about food in their bodies and health a certain way. And it's going to take a little more than, than one conversation at a, at a meal time where you point out things on their plate, I think to to move people along. And I've just learned to be a bit more patient and give people some data, ask questions and kind of move them along over, over time, especially if there's no immediate health crisis. Yeah. I mean, I, uh, if you talk about the seven days Mendes, most people don't understand, but uh, you know, Kellogg's basically set up the dietetics, um, you know, uh, organizations in this country which then molded into our government policy on our, our nutrition policy. And uh, even to this day, for example, the, ACL, uh, the ACLM, American College of Lifestyle Medicine, literally this week published a consensus paper on diabetes, which says that it must be vegan. That uh, doesn't mention anything about low carb, keto, even though the ADA and the AHA now recognize it's a very healthy way of eating, the ACLM, says that a for diabetes, the optimal diet is plant-based and low in meat and processed meat, right? This is literally their words, quote unquote, in their conclusion. So what people need to understand is that, you know, oftentimes special interests, public policy uh, can, can have noble goals potentially, but some disastrous endpoints. And that continues into our neighborhood, right? OK, in our neighborhood, you know, we have a mayor whose lifestyle was reversed with veganism, right, with plant based eating. Right. So he really improved his health. And, you know, he may have this noble goal. I want people to have what I have. Right. And then now we have, you know, meatless Mondays and vegan Fridays. And I worry about, you know, those healthcare disparities that you mentioned, the first sentence you said about your father with diabetes. I wonder about the effects of. uh you know, these public policies on the people who have 
the least, right? On the people who have the least. And, you know, coming back to the mental health and B12 deficiency that you hinted at, right? And this lack of brain fog that you feel, you know, what is the mental health impact of being, having these public policies on our children, right? We know that plant-based eating for children results in lower IQ, in stunting, and meat supplementation does the reverse. So I think about all these things and people think, well, Tro, you're jimble jobbling a bunch of topics. No, this is literally playing out in real life on our inner city school kids, right? Where theology and bias is influencing policy, which is impacting the mental health of our young kids and the development and growth of our kids, literally an intervention that lowers their IQ is being put on them. And I think to myself, who best to talk about this interplay between the disparities in healthcare, the mental health crisis, and the guy who's been vegan and keto, you know, who best to talk about it all. So uh, tell us, you know, educate us. Am I, well, I, mean, am I crazy here to see the, a connection between all of these? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a very good point. I think, I think one of the things that people need to realize is that when, when policymakers who are often the cultural elites who, I mean, you know, they have their own fads as well. The, the difference is the difference is when they, when they become enamored by something, they're in positions to, to put it uh, into, into law and policy and what we've seen decade after decade in the history of this country is that the lower class are often the non-consenting group that they experiment on, right? I mean, that's yeah, what we've seen. It goes seen. back to the CDC. I mean, just to, we should bring this up, right? So Tuskegee is something we should absolutely talk about. I mean, this is exactly what you were saying. And this, I don't think that culture has ever changed. Right. It goes back as far as I can see. Right. And we've done horrific things. Nobody was ever fired, by the way. They, they did apologies later on. Nobody was ever fired for Tuskegee, which is an experiment where we basically gave syphilis to, you know, African-Americans in this country. I mean, it was the most terrible healthcare experiment that I've seen in the past 50 years. Yeah, there was about 425 or so uh, men in in Tuskegee, Alabama, uh, who were who were allowed to, under medical supervision, uh, be untreated for syphilis as the U.S. government continued to record the effects on on their bodies. This program lasted from about 1942 or 43 to 1972. That's how late it was. It was 1972. Nobody was fired. Not one. Nobody person. was fired. Nobody was fired, and and one of the uh, a men that was was uh, uh, well, I mean, so I'll, I'll say it this way: le le leading up to that, of course, was eugenics, right? And that's where the U.S. government also began to do the sorts of medical experiments to determine if people were were mentally fit for marriage and things like that. And one of the things they did there, again, under uh, under government sanctioned medical supervision was sterilize, forcibly sterilize women. Uh, so in the late 19th century, early 20th century, up to about World War II, 2000 women were forcibly sterilized because the 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 U.S. government gave doctors the the freedom to declare them mentally feeble minded. And it started in New Jersey. It started in New Jersey, Doc. And and it went up, up Maine, up to Maine, down the East Coast, as far west as Louisiana, uh, up up the Mississippi River, St. Louis in, in Chicago. And in, in 1920, if you were if you were lower class and wanted to get married and the doctor declared the woman, not the man, but the woman feeble minded, they wouldn't let him get married. And this and this sort of began a series of, of medically supervised experiments on the poor and the people making the decisions don't ever pay the consequences when the when the policy goes bad. We saw this, we saw this with with eugenics. Uh, we saw this with the Tuskegee experiment. Uh, we also saw this with the 
uh, experiment in Guatemala between 1946 and 1948, when syphilis and gonorrhea and cancoid was was intentionally uh, given to about 3,000 inmates in, in in Guatemala, and the man that that, that headed that, that program uh, has a has a um, uh, a building named after him at, at the University of Pittsburgh, and so and so we have a history of, of this. And we've we've seen this now for over a century where the U.S. government and policymakers will arrive at a conclusion that they think is best for everybody else. And then they they will administer that policy on poor people. And when it goes bad, poor people suffer. And so in New York, what do you see right now? You see this in lots of large, large metropolitan areas, policymakers. They have a they have something they're interested in. They believe it's good. They administer it and codify it in policy. Did anybody do a trial for, on our kids? Did anybody say, let's right. actually see if this is going to work? Did anybody do that? Absolutely yeah. not. It, it's, it's just sort of fiat. We think it's good. So let's make let's make low income families and, and children do this. And by the way, if it doesn't work, right? If it if it goes poorly, it doesn't no. affect them because they're gonna be retired in Boca somewhere. Yeah, yeah, right. Absolutely right. And I think this plays in because of the intervention that they're trying to put on the kids in New York City, you know. And we know that meat supplementation increases IQ, and we know that meat abstention has impacts on mental health, due in part by B12 deficiency and some other issues. You know, I, I think this is a perfect segue into uh, mental health. But before we get there, I want to ask this one question. What do you think the impact of uh, Tuskegee and these other things, you know, what do you think the impact is on people like your father to come see somebody like me saying, hey, look, I can help your diabetes. You know, I can help you with diet and lifestyle. What do you think that does on people like your father Right. Should they trust me? I would say no. You know, what do you think the impact is, the psychological impact or the generational impact of not being able to trust doctors? That's a great question. My, my father was actually in the Tuskegee area during those experiments. And I think for his generation, there's a there's a skepticism. There's a skepticism about about the doctor and and whether or not the doctor is actually treating what he or she says they're treating, or are they using you to do something else? I mean, there's always a, there's always a, a a bit of a skepticism there. We saw this during the pandemic, Um, you know, in terms of the the push for being vaccinated, people in my family are like, I don't know. I don't think I'm not going in, not yet, because I don't know what's in that needle. And I'm not sure if they're not, if, you know, if they're going to use us for experiments. But that actually did happen. But there overall, overall, I mean, there has been some some general distrust in in recognizing and having confidence that the medical uh, industry is or rather the, the, the healthcare industry is actually for black people. Wait, I mean, but hold been, on. I, w- I want to point out that could be a bad thing, right? That could be a very bad thing. And I can see it being a bad thing. But look what it did in you. Right. You when your doctor came to you and said, you know, here's metformin, that distrust may have actually helped you. Yeah. Yeah. What, what I was going to say, it, it introduces some help, some some healthy skepticism. Yeah. And I, I think I think, you know, what what's happened, especially now that. You know, in, in my in my own family, my, my, my cousin is married to an anesthesiologist. Uh, my own brother is a, a pharmacist. Uh, we have medical professionals in our family. And so now when the doctor tells us something, we just don't take it at face value. We ask questions, we do research, we ask around, we look it up, and then we get second, third, fourth, fifth, you know, 10th opinions. And then we say, okay, maybe maybe we'll go ahead and and proceed with the recommendation. So so it introduced some distrust, it introduced some healthy skepticism. I you know, in, in in some respects, this might sound this might sound a bit counterintuitive. I 
part of me wishes that it, it introduced more skepticism. Uh, so, for example, with with a program in New York, that when the mayor says meatless, meatless Mondays, that families say, well, well wait, wait a minute. Uh, maybe why, why? Why is that good? I mean, especially if you think about the fact that so many low income families, their diets are already nutritionally deficient at home. Why would we why would we want them to have nutritionally deficient diets at school? And and maybe maybe there's they should be asking more questions about nutrients uh, rather than if it's if it's vegan or vegetarian or not. And and as you noted, it's nutrient deficiency that is so that's responsible for so many of the the pathologies that we see expressed, uh, particularly in, in in children. And that that to me is not is not enough a part of the discussion. I mean, if children if children are are experiencing nutrient deficiency, they can't learn, they can't sleep. They're much more likely to have uh, ADD and ADHD symptoms. They can't concentrate, right? I mean, all these things are associated with nutrient deficiency. Depression, you know, poor performance in school, more more sick days. I mean, on and on and on. Yeah, absolutely. And and just looking at that, I remember seeing some of the WIC program. I, they call it different things in different places, but you see the food they're giving them. It was calories they were giving them, not nutrition. That was the problem. Absolutely. I mean, if... You know, this this would be a completely different uh, a podcast or a different day. But if you just think about the role of the, the corn industry and and uh, subsidized food, I mean, you see the Native American populations, the stuff that they send to, to, to uh, the reservations, the, the 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 sorts of food that we see in, in low income communities, they are setting them up for metabolic distress they're setting them up for that right because th those diets are, are just are just saturated just saturated with corn and high fructose corn syrup and sugar and carbs so why why are we doing this to people i mean to me to me it, it just blows my mind that that we have all of the data we've we've known this data for years because we know that if we feed these things to pigs they get fat we've known this and so we give it to children and then and then we get surprised when when type when they get juvenile diabetes i mean to me the whole thing's just absolutely scandalous but you mentioned you see you know, like in your schools now i mean it's it it, it was kind of almost maybe really sad before we came on you mentioned you're just seeing it again and again well, I mean, when yeah, when you when you travel when you travel to to college campuses, as I do, because I, I I speak a lot, and you just look around at at students walking, there are high levels of obesity, very very high, and often people believe they're 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 eating they're eating healthy, and they can't understand why they are obese, and their diets are full of, full of carbs i mean if you go to a college event right the standard uh, 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 food option is going to be pizza yeah well guess what that's going to do or it's just so much bread it's so much bread and then all the snacks the doritos chips the oreo cookies right i mean that's sort of what we do to kids we constantly shove bad food down their throats and then are surprised when when they're unhealthy and if they if they've experienced that through middle school and high school they will arrive on campus with very very bad uh, uh, eating habits and very poor uh, food choices and you're just beginning to see, see it across the campus now and and in fact you know one, one of the fraternities I'm, I'm doing some research on fraternities uh, for my next next book and one of the fraternities at the university of virginia uh, sigma phi they've decided to focus on fitness as as a part of their fraternity culture which is great which is great and and we need we need much more of that because it's it's pretty it's pretty alarming some of the, some of the things that i'm seeing right now
can you can you talk can you walk us through i i want to share some statistics and uh i want to be very mindful of of how we bring this topic up but you know i've been very concerned about the mental health of our young men in this country for a very long time in fact when i reached out to you several months ago it was that in fact topic i was like this guy is going out studying the people who are suffering from mental health issues the most right and i just want to share some of those statistics you know the rate of uh men going into young men going into college right now is the lowest it's ever been it's 40 percent of men now you know going into college are actually men um the overwhelming majority almost two-thirds of uh people in college are women the amount of substance abuse including uh drugs alcohol is double that in men of women and this is worldwide not just the united states in the united states is much worse the amount of men in prison in the United States is in, in particularly uh, minorities, we should talk about that, who have been affected the most. But the amount of men in prison is approaching two million in this country, OK, in the prison system. Uh, and over I think it's 90 percent are, are men that are incarcerated. The amount of suicide deaths, 70 percent are men uh, and particularly young men. And, you know, this statistic, which relates to a recent tragedy, you know, and, and I and I know there's are complex issues with with guns and, and I don't want to talk about that, but I just want to talk about the mental health side of it because I'm passionate about that. As I said months ago, when I reached out to you, I'm passionate about that. Ninety nine percent of mass shooters are men. Right. So what is going on in our young men? Right. And and there is a mental health crisis, in my opinion, in our young men. Um, and what can you talk to us about this and the pressures it puts on the family unit from a theological perspective, spiritual perspective? Can you tell us about this problem and what we can do? That's a that's a great question. You know, I've been I've been teaching both at the high school and college level now for over over 20 years and I have seen an, an increase in, in what would probably be best called resignation. Uh, increasingly number, an increasing number of guys who are just checked out. They're just resigned. And, and they don't, it's not, it's not that they're lazy. It's just they don't care. They're not ambitious. They're not interested in self-mastery. They don't have any big goals. They just want to be left alone. They don't want to cause any trouble. Uh, you know, they, they, don't, they don't want to stir anything up. They just want to be left alone. And they've, they, they've just resigned from society. And what's different, what's different is that the Internet provides a place for, for young men to resign into. If you don't want to participate in in society and culture if you don't want to uh if you want to be left alone you can just really lose yourself into a video game you can you can get stuck on youtube for hours on end you can you can uh, uh, hang out on spotify etc and and typically what what happens in a boy's life is that there's usually a time when his wings get clipped uh, usually something happens, a series of things or or a series of things that don't happen where he loses his motivation and his interest in in self-improvement and, and, and agency and efficacy, believing that that my life is important and that I can make a positive difference in, in the world. And that and that clipping of those wings, which can happen in the context of, of abuse but can also happen in the context of neglect. Neglect being a, a young boy having narcissistic parents who are so into themselves that they aren't paying attention to what their, what their sons actually need. And so what I'm seeing now is this entire sort of generation of young men who were just resigned. They're nice guys. They might have great academic uh, 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 performance. They may be pleasant to be around, but they just don't care. 
And you're exactly right. And and not only not only are they not going to college, they're dropping out of the workforce completely. If you look at workforce participation rates, those are also in, in pretty tragic decline. We have about 3 million prime age men right now. That's between the age of, of 25 and 54. This is pre-pandemic, who are just doing nothing. They're not working. They're not looking for work. They're just doing, doing nothing. And so we, we really have to do some work in providing a context for, for young men to see that they matter and that we need them and that our society uh, is, is requesting their, their uh, presence. I, I often define it in, in terms of, uh, 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 well, not, not just, not just uh, a masculinity as, as, it's, as it's often uh, described, but this this certain type of of of, of, of masculinity, the opposite of, of toxic uh, masculinity, heroic masculinity, right? What's heroic masculinity? It's using your 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 presence and your strength and your power for the service of benefiting other people. And this is what I'm finding young men don't have. They don't know why society needs them. They don't know what they're here for. They don't know what unique contributions they can make. And so they're checked out. We also, are, we also aren't asking much of them. And so if we expect nothing from young men and then, and then they don't see that they matter, they resign. They resign. And what's been so fascinating is that when I, when I introduce, when, when I travel across campuses and I introduce to these young guys, hey, we need you. We need you to be, to be awesome at using your, your, your presence and your strength and your capacities and your creativities. We need you to make other people's lives better. Boom. I see it. The light, the light bulbs come on. They get motivated. And all of a sudden, there's this energy to want to want to participate in civil society and, and to make their communities and their campuses and their relationships better. But no one's invited them to be better. No one's inviting these young men to be people of influence and to be people who are who are sacrificially serving other people because they want to make other people's lives better. I think what's what's really expired and has become disinterested, this interesting is this idea that my life exists for the purpose of making money. That that doesn't work anymore. That that no longer inspires a, a, a young man to want to to be excellent. What I'm what I'm finding that's far more persuasive is that is that we need you to be outstanding men because you will make the you will make the world better you will make your community better you'll make your family better you'll make a, a place of employment better by you being awesome by you being the kind of man that that you have all of the requisite uh, capabilities to be and that that it's an invitation to virtue it's an invitation uh, to be to be wise and to be uh, righteous uh, and 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 to and to to be a person of of justice, right? It's it's an invitation to be great, not an invitation to not be bad. And that's that's what we've been talking to guys about for the last fifteen years. Don't be bad. Don't look at porn. Get off video games, right? Don't be dangerous. Uh, don't hurt women. It's a series of 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 understanding masculinity as negation, rather rather than helping them formulate what it means to be a virtuous man of character and virtue, because they add value to whatever room they're in and and into whatever whatever space they're in. And so this level of of resignation, I would argue, is 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 a crisis. I, I wish I could use a stronger word, 
but it is it is alarming. And if you have a daughter, you should be incredibly afraid. Because if you expect your daughter to get married, the the applicant, well, the applicant pool, uh, the 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 suitor pool, if I could use that phrase, for your daughter's future husband, if she goes to college, it's slim. It's really really slim, and and the suicide rate, the suicidal ideation with college guys right now, it has me nervous. J- at at the university. I won't, I won't name the university because some of this detail, some of these details aren't public. Uh, there is a university in the South where there were, there were two young men in fraternities who died within a week of each other from overdosing. Overdosing. There were two students at a university, two guys at, the, at a university in Massachusetts, a polytechnical university there within a couple of weeks. Suicide. The guys in our college campuses are not only disappearing because of low enrollment, but the ones that are there, that are there, have extremely high rates of anxiety, depression, substance abuse, and suicidal ideation. It's not just binge drinking that we need to be worried about right now. Yeah, it's we had not- we had students at West Point too that overdose, and you know, it, it's just incredible what we're seeing in front of our eyes. And a lot of people predicted this was coming, and I think. You know, part of it, Troy, you mentioned, you know, the numbers on men and you look at how many of those men had no father at home or no role model, no one in the community who reached out to him. And I think that's the tragedy we're seeing. We've broken up the family and there's no support. No one said, hey, let me show you how to tie a tie. Let me show you how to shake a hand and look someone in the eye. And and this morning I woke up and I was thinking, where's the integrity? Like I've seen all these crazy studies come out and they're pushing the agenda rather than trying to get the science and you think where's the integrity at some point like how could everyone be sold out and and you know worry about either fitting along you know uh, political correctness or they worry about uh you know catching the eye of someone who's gonna you're gonna be in trouble if you if you speak truth well you 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 actually nailed it when you when you said when you said support yeah mentorship absolutely i think that's the only way the guys don't feel supported the the K through twelve school system is designed to to equip girls for success. If your son's in a public school K to twelve, the school is 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 really designed for girls. So he's not going to get supported at school. We have a lot of homes that are completely broken down, and we have homes where dads are at home, but they're not really investing in their sons that well. So there's some dad, de- there's some dad deprivation there as well. Dr. Bradley, what do you mean by that? Because that caught me off guard. Like, uh, you know, I have a daughter, I have sons, and, you know, they're both in K through 12 public schools. So, you know, what do you mean by uh, it's designed for girls? Because I don't understand that. Yeah, great, great question. So, so if if you look at if you look at some of the the changes in in what teachers expect from students in the classroom in terms of classroom management, but also in terms of of the sorts of content that that students are encouraged to 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 write about and think about. Uh, if a if a boy in the seventh grade is given freedom. I'll, I'll go further. Third grade is given freedom to write, for example, a short story. And let's say he draws a dragon and the dragon kills an animal and all over his sheet, it's got it's his blood and guts and and uh, dead, dead animals on there. His parents might be called uh, because there may be something wrong with the lad because he is he might have some violent tendencies about him. Right. Uh, uh, Increasingly, if, if boys are roughhousing, if boys are roughhousing at school, uh, that's seen in, in, in many cases as a cause for concern because of because of, of aggression and violence. I've seen that data on the roughhousing that you've posted, and it struck me. I have it written down here. You know, fraternities, roughhousing. You know, this explosion of BJJ mentors. People are looking for mentors. You know. Do we not mentor our kids in these schools? It's it's not just that. It's it's that it's that the the, the way that we organize the classroom often often has much more uh, sensibilities to the ways in which girls relate to to each other, and so 
for example, there's an elementary school across the street from me, and I, if I had a camera, I could just sh- show you the playground across the street from me, and you can see on the playground that 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 the girls are are huddled around each other. They're laughing and joking, things like that, but they're not moving around. They're kind of sitting around, kind of talking, playing. But boys, however, are all over the place. I mean, they're kicking the soccer ball, and and it's 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 amazing to see. And in a, in a classroom, in a classroom, it, it's increasingly become a place where where boys are often diagnosed as being ADD or ADHD because they can't sit still in a classroom at seven or ten, and and that may not be because he has AD or, or ADHD. He it may be because he's a boy. Uh, and so we have we have we over medicate our boys, and so w- what we do is we numb them. We kind of numb the kind of natural boyness out of them pretty early on. And so we medicate our, our our kids for ADD and ADHD five times more than any other uh, country in the developed world. Well, gonna, so I mean, those I'm are gonna, those are the sorts I'm of challenge you, Doctor Bradley, because you said the natural boyness, you know, because uh, I don't think there's any biologists here you know, right now. So, um, you know, but uh, I know I'm just kidding around, but, but so there's a problem in the schools. It's well, I mean, there, there is, well, there is a problem there. I mean, that's just one side of the problem. And the other side of the problem is there's not any, there's not any male teachers either. It, it's, it's rare. It's rare unless you're in a private school that, that a boy will experience a male teacher before the eighth grade. I think I looked that up. It was like 20%, 20%, very low amount. And elementary teachers, even less, it was like 10%. Yeah. Right. Well, and even then they're under immense pressure not to talk about masculinity. Like they're under pressure. If they say something, they get in trouble too. I've talked to teachers about that. You know, what, what do you do in a public school? What the heck do you do? How do you, you know, and I think part of it is the parents have relinquished parenthood and let the teach the teachers you know have them have responsibility over how their kids view the life and morality and their worldview yeah and so and so we, we've often we've we've often also abrogated this to to technology and their phones and an ipad and things like that i mean we've kind of let the boys uh, out to, to kind of hang out out to dry and and we're seeing the outcomes of a lot of benign neglect because, and rightly so, we focus so much on providing great opportunities for girls because of, you know, years and years and years of, of neglect on that side. The boys have just <clears throat> have just been kind of kind of left behind and, and, we're, and we're seeing them we're seeing them check out uh, uh, because of it. So I'm interested in doing something crazy. Uh, which is inviting inviting parents and grandparents and cousins and aunts and uncles to invite the the boys and and young men in their life to greatness and and to provide opportunities for them to test those things out over over time and including whatever it takes to to help initiate them into believing that they can make a difference and that they do matter and that we actually we actually need them. The one thing that I wish I could go to every college campus and get all the guys in the football stadium or the basketball arena and just say to them is that we need you. That's the opposite message that, that we've heard for the last 20 years. The, 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 the message for the last 20 years like has been, well, no, we don't need you uh, because men mess things up. And there's this been this this consistent diatribe monologue that every problem in society is because of men, and and, and the solutions to the problems in society is getting rid of men. And if you are a, a boy, you go through adolescence and high school, and you're just hearing, <coughs> excuse me, uh, that you are you are nothing but the problem. Why go to college? Why go to work? So, so it sounds like what our kids need, what, what our men need, you know, and I wrote this down, uh, you know, mentorship, uh, calling, um, and, uh, you know, what, what strikes me is, um, you know, I read the APAs, you know, uh, 
guidelines on masculinity. Uh, just for everybody who knows, the APA is the group who condoned waterboarding. Okay, um, so just if you don't know, and I, I said, wow, amazing that somebody's finally, you know, uh, talking about these issues that men need. And I didn't walk away feeling like they had a good concept of what it is to be masculine and what are the needs of our young kids. Um, they touched, I, I felt like it was a noble goal, but kind of, you know, uh, I don't know, maybe it's my own bias of the group. I cannot support a group that has literally condoned uh, waterboarding and torture. So what did you think of that? <laughs> Am I biased? Did they do a good job in their guidelines? You know, or I don't know if you took a took a look at that. Yeah, I, I have I have seen those. I think I think what, what was interesting is that those guidelines were an attempt to address the problem. And and at the conclusion, it seemed that that the, the they say aggression is not good. Right. Exactly. Exactly. That, that's where I was going. I mean, it it it. It seemed that at, at, at the end, they they wanted guys to be the kind of men that no bot, no guy wants to be. Yep. Right. Yep. Um, aggression's great. It's misplaced aggression. That's the problem. Um, being ambitious is great. It's misplaced ambition. That's the problem. And so. And so the, the, the sorts of aspirations that they laid out at the end, what what 18, 19 year old guy wants to do that? And so what do they do? Which makes sense to me, right? They go play a video game because the video game allows them to to aspire to the values and virtues that they believe they can exercise out here in the real world. And they resign there. For hours and hours and hours on end, and it can, can, to me it makes complete sense. So I, I told an audience recently, if you have a concern about young men playing video games too much, then get off your butt and go get one or two of them and go do something. Yeah, right? a lot of a lot of people will point out the problem, but they don't give the solution. They just say this is a problem, but we don't do anything. There's you know mentors yeah. and and helping young kids to get on track or, you know, just teaching them life skills, you know, something that will be beneficial to them in life. And I think more young, as an example of what we're, you know, the mental health crisis, as a matter of fact, going back through when we said, Hey, people start doing low carb or treating diabetes or preventing diabetes. And all of a sudden their moods better, their focus, their, their attention, their relationships, their, all these things that get better. And when they said, you guys are quacks and you should have your license taken for even talking about this, but we saw it, it was happening. And it happens to this day. I talked to two people this morning already with that, but I get a call from one of my great patients. And he says, Hey, I, I need your help on something. My grandson is acting out in school. He's aggressive towards other kids in, in a way that's like pathologic. And so the, the, the kid's mom called the pediatrician's office and said, look, I'm really concerned. He's acting. I'm afraid he could be another, another statistic. And they said, 11 weeks to see the primary, <laughs> 11 weeks. Like, there's no urgency. There's no sense of urgency. That, hey, this is a big problem. You got to take care of this. And the mental health control, you know, as well as I do, we do a, a psychiatry referral. Good luck. It's going to be at least two months to get into someone. You know, it's it's devastating. You, Everyone's overwhelmed. Saying, this is the problem, Brian. And, I, and, you know, this is where we get told you guys should keep your mouth shut. But, but, uh, but this is the problem is where do you send somebody? I think this kid needs mentorship, guidance, leadership, needs to be inspired. Like go see your psychiatrist. They're going to get medicated, mm -hmm. right? Go see yeah. a psychologist. Go see your teacher. Who's going to, are they going to be able to relate to that person? I don't know. I'm not, I'm not sure that we're equipped to deal with this. And the only solution I see is what Dr. Bradley pointed out. Like we need fathers, grandfathers, uncles, people in the community to be mentors. You know, I, am I am I wrong here, Dr. Bradley? Absolutely. I've seen this. I, I've, I've been working with with youth and, and young adults for, for 20 years. And I think we underestimate the magic of presence and hospitality. If you want to change a young man's life, just hang out with him. Yeah. Eat with him. Okay. Go go cook some food together. Right. 
And it's amazing how that works. I'll, I'll give you a great example. I've been, I've been, uh, I've been mentoring this, this young man now for a number of years. When I met him, he was a high school, high school sophomore, uh, headed in a bad direction. His dad was in prison. He was selling drugs. He was really good at selling drugs. He was about to become a statistic. His Spanish teacher reached out at our church and said, hey, can somebody hang out with this guy? And, and some people said no, which to me is still boggles my mind. And I said, yeah, I'll hang out with him. What did we do? We went to Denny's. That's all we did. Went to Denny's. And, and he just ate the whole menu, which is fine. Uh, but that, that turned into a long-term relationship where he walked, he walked away from drugs got a vision, wanted to go to college, right? Now he's, now he's around 30 years old. He's in his early 30s, starting a business, things like that. But that started just from going to Denny's. It doesn't, it doesn't take much. It doesn't take much. But it, it's, it's hard for us to have a culture or, or a community with mentorship when people are, are retiring at 50 and 55 and then spending six months in Phoenix playing golf or going, or going on serial cruises and things like that. I mean, a lot of our mentors, a lot of the men that are, are available are playing. They're on extended vacation, uh, which is also part of the problem. Uh, and so we, we need more investment in our neighbors and in our communities if we want to get traction on this because it it may not it, it may not be the case that they need some sort of medical intervention they may just need a relational intervention and that doesn't require anything more than than food together uh, 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 doing some fun activity together building something together, doing some shared activity together, because that's how men build relationships and letting the conversations come out of that. I had a dad tell me recently that he started spending more time with his son and his grades went up. It wasn't because he sat down and had more lectures with him. It wasn't because they had a talk about his grades. He just started to spend more time with them engaged him, talked to him. They started having more fun together. And the boys' grades in high school just went up. So I think, I think the, the problems are there, but the solutions are literally right in front of us. And we have to activate our imaginations a little bit and be willing to sacrifice some time and some, a little bit of change, right? Some pocket change. And spend time with each other. I think I think there's so much disconnection in our culture. There's so much brokenness in family systems that, that the opportunity for for mentorship is is really ripe. That we should be taking advantage of it. Dr. Bradley, I'm gonna chime in here. I, I you know, one thing I'd like to point out is you you go to some of these. You know, the APA says we should decrease violence. It's part of toxic masculinity, and then. I would tell them, you know, besides the fact that they tell our men not to be violent and then yet still tell the CIA that they can torture people. So I want to just come back to that. I think that's very hypocritical. But go to a boxing ring. All men. Right. Look at their mental health. You know, these are community oriented places. Right. These boxing clubs. Right. That literally it's a violent act. But it's mentored, co- there's coaches, there's a team, there's a go to a BJJ, you know, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, you know, it's 90% men in there, right? It's a violence, you know, it's a violent sport. And yet there's this camaraderie, respect, there's a, a you know, so as I, Dr. Bradley I, said, it's controlled aggression, right? You have control, you, you control these guys. And that, that's what I love about, you know, seeing things like MMA and boxing, these guys will beat the heck out of each other for however many rounds they go and then they hug each other and there's respect and they hold each other's arm up and they lift each other up and you go wow these guys are just trying to break each other's arms but there's a respect level there and there's a you know for most people not everyone of course but you know when you see that and you say well there, there's something about competition like 
All yeah. guys, uh, every dad I talk to says, I, I can't stand that they don't keep score at this soccer game because someone has to win and lose. You know, it's like all the kids know who win and lose still. They keep track of it. You know, I mean, this 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 fear of competition or, or uh, you know, not everyone gets an A in the class. You, you work hard and you kind of learn those things. But I th- but I think the thing there is, Brian, is absolutely we, there's the societal elements, you know, but, you know, these things are truly, you know, violent things. I'm not telling everybody, go put your kids into an octagon and, you know, let them beat the crap out of each other. What I am saying is, you know, even things that are offshoots of that, like, let's say CrossFit right? Where there's no combat, right? Or there's no, you know, striking, but, but you're aggressive in your exertional capacity and, but it's a team environment. There's a coach, there's a, there's a team working together, you know, and again, CrossFit is predominantly men, right? Yeah. And, or, or, uh, or getting kids, even without the aggression part, you say you get kids to go, let's go clean the senior home. Let's go help talk to seniors. Let's go and do, you know, some, something for the, the lady down the street. She needs a handicap ramp. Let's build that together. But, and you have but mentors point, and you, you, you're, you're, it's not all about you. It's about reaching out to other people. But the step back, right? These are, you know, aggressive, violent things. These things that I mentioned, which are in direct contrast to what the APA says, which is, you know, we don't want traditional masculinity is toxic, you know? Um, so, you know, maybe we can close off, you know, on rounding out this, this idea of, of, you know, is it, you know, maybe violence isn't the, you know, violence, certainly we don't want violence, but you look at these venues, you know, CrossFit, BJJ and boxing, every single one of those areas that I've been to, you know, the camaraderie, the mentorship is through the roof. And that's because it's, it's controlled aggression and, and, and violence, right? Um, it's not reckless. And, and men that don't have, men who've never been properly fathered or mentored are reckless with their physical capacity. And that's, that's one of the best contributions that a, that a sage has to a young man is to help him understand when to use when to properly use his aggression and, and when to be violent and when not to be violent. And we, we need to have more men who are depositing that sort of wisdom uh, to young guys so that they are making a net contribution to their communities instead of being a liability uh, when their aggression and violence is reckless and harmful. Yeah, even even in MMA, MMA is the same thing. The you know they'll try to get in the other guy's head to make him lose, get really upset. And when they get upset, they lose their game plan, right? So they're like, calm down, pace yourself. It's going to be okay. And I think that's we need more of that in life, where you say, hey, pace yourself. Let's not have uncontrolled aggression and you know taking out your you know beating up people on the school ground because you're frustrated with what's happening at home. And and it's a big problem. I think. I'm so glad to have you on because I think it's so critical. I've been really lamenting this, seeing young men who don't take personal responsibility or they don't think about the other person first, you know, all these kind of things were, were, you know, we're all worried about our own pronouns. We don't care about someone else's rights and what, what they believe. And, and so it's, it's really a tough, it's a tough spot because a lot of people are being bullied. If you don't, if you don't toe the line, if you say, Hey, I, here's how I believe, you know, I want to raise my kids, you know, and it's a, it's really a, it, it's really a, a challenging time for everyone. And there's a lot of confusion out there. Yeah. I don't, I don't really envy my parents right now because it's just a minefield uh, of, of special interest causes that you have to navigate. And I think this is why a lot of parents are more parents are homeschooling and more and more parents are enrolling their kids in private school um, because it's, it's, it's so incredibly difficult right now uh, because, because all these ideologies are sort of speaking and they're, they're, they, they, they don't, teach consistently what's taught at home. And there's too much of a disparity between what parents teach at home and what a lot of kids are getting at their, at their own schools. And it's, it's really created some difficult uh, situations. And so, and what, and so what we're seeing is that boys start, start to check out in middle school. I mean, if you look at high school graduation rates for boys, those are, those are also declining. So by the time a kid's in ninth or 10th grade, he begins to think, I don't think school's for me. I don't think this is really for me. And they just kind of coast along until they can, can finally graduate, uh, if, if, they, if they graduate at all. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close off here because we're coming on time. 
you know, I, I want to read this quote and see if we all can support this. Uh, you know, this is a, you know, a controversial quote, but I think it's worth bringing up. A harmless man is not a good man. A good man is a very dangerous man who has that under voluntary control. What do you think of that one? Brian, you heard that one before? Yeah, I've heard that. Actually, I don't know who I don't know who quoted that, yeah. but I personally like that. I like that. You know, if you're you know, harmless, meaning that you just don't want to stand up for anything. You just don't want to stand up for what you believe. And it's so many people are afraid. I, I'm afraid a lot of times I go, hey, here's what I think about it. Here's how my dad raised me. And they go, oh, you can't say that. They canceled right? you. They can't. Right. You spoke up. Right. And YouTube. That, just just think about this. I got canceled and, and Tro knows I'm the one who's saying, Tro, tone it down. Don't, don't, don't be controversial. I had a doctor on that's a hospice doctor. He told me what he was seeing in clinic over the last month or so. And they, they nailed him for medical misinformation. Not one person called him, says, is this true? Can we see our records? Can we, you know, sit and meet with us? There was no judge, jury, nothing. He was guilty because he said what he was saying. So either he's delusional or he's lying. <laughs> Right. That's the only stance. So when you see that and, 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 you know, I think it goes that back to you, Dr. Bradley, you had enough intelligence to say, wait a minute, I don't like what the doctor's telling me. Let me research it myself. But if I can only give you one side of the story and say, everyone has to go on metformin and there's no other alternative, then you never figure out what to do. You know? And, and so I think there's so much of that right now where we think everyone is so, uh, you know, and I think the school has, you know, Tro and I have talked about this a lot where people don't use critical thinking and say, wait a minute, if this is true, then this should be true too. Right. And when you look at it that way, you, you start thinking it and it's almost like we're raising young men not to have critical thinking. It's just, they told us to do this and that's what you do. And if you don't do it, you don't follow that. You're a bad person, right? Yeah, it's really a hard thing. You don't want to be aggressive. You don't, and you don't want to question. You want to just follow the line and just tow in and you lose, you lose your ability to say, Hey, wait, doc, I don't agree with you. Cause I love people who come in and go, Hey doc, here's what I read. What do you think of this article? And, and other doctors get upset. I was like, let me look at it and read it. And I'll get back to you. Right. Yeah, let's let's think about this, right? That's the thing. I think and you hit it, Brian, right? Like, you know, I, I hear this every day, Troy, you're too aggressive. I don't think I'm aggressive enough. I don't think I'm aggressive enough. When a doctor too aggressive. To count your calories, right? And I'm like, like, you stop. Like you are harming people, you know, count your calories. I'm not saying, you know, I, I I think I should be more aggressive. But anyway, Dr. Bradley, what do you say? A harmless man is not a good man. A good man is a very dangerous man who has that under voluntary control. That is actually one way of talking about meekness. Uh, I think often the, the, the common conception may be that, that meekness is just is softness. But, but a man who's meek is someone who, who knows his ability to wield strength and power and danger and he chooses to withhold it on purpose that's meekness and so in the christian tradition the the, the lion is the image of meekness because as we've all seen nature videos a male lion just kind of sitting around doing nothing, kind of hanging around until he needs to use his power and strength. He's never reckless, not abusive, but when it's time to use it, he uses it. Otherwise, he's just kind of hanging out. And so, and so, this is what meekness means. It's interesting in the in the Christian tradition, uh, Jesus encourages people to be meek. He's often described as meek. And I don't think people realize what that means is that he decided to withhold his power for the sake of doing other things, right? He could have, he could have come out and destroyed everything. Uh, and so, and so being meek is knowing that you have power and strength, you have the capacity to, to do real damage as we, as, as you might say today, but you withhold that. So, so the guy who is at the bar and he knows he can whoop the guy's butt, but he chooses not to because he doesn't want the guy to get a broken arm, a broken leg, a broken nose, be in the hospital for two weeks because he knows he can do it. That guy's meek. He's not a punk. He's not a coward, right? He's a stallion, right? Because that guy has it together because he withheld himself from destroying the guy because he knew he could do it. And, and 
compassionate. Absolutely. It was mercy. It was mercy. And, yeah. And you right. don't mistake kindness for weakness, right? Like people know, I mean, when you know you're the, you're the lion, you don't have to show everyone you're the lion all the time. <laughs> exactly. exactly. It's generally the mentally weak who are the most boisterous and loud and, you know, picking the, and two of my best friends were the big guys and everyone want to pick a fight with them. No one messed with me. They're like, they don't want to fight with the little, they'll fight the big guy. They want to show how macho they are. And they're, you know, then they it usually wasn't a good idea. <laughs> And so, and so what, what would it look like for us to, to raise young men to be meek, uh, for, to, 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 to give them a sense that, that they are strong, that they matter, they have a lot of capacity to wield their, their power and their presence for good or evil, and to encourage them to use it for good, and not try to emasculate them by saying that having it is bad. Uh, but having it is good, and we want you to use it for the benefit of others. And we want to, to, to encourage them to develop it, to hone it, and to control it. Because there will come a time where they may need to use all of their aggression and their violence to protect someone's life, to stand in for their children, maybe even, unfortunately, you know, to protect their country. So you don't need to tap it out. You need to, to cultivate it and hone it and, and allow them to use it when necessary. Someone needs to step in and, and tell the bully to not be a bully. I, rem, I, I, was, I was telling a, a group of fourth graders a few months ago that they have a lot of capacity, even in fourth grade, to fight against evil. And this kid pops up to me and he says, oh, wait, you mean you mean I can actually like stop a bully from bullying? I was like, yes, exactly, exactly. Learn BJJ first. <laughs> you know, <laughs> learn you, as first. When you when you when you see something wrong, act. Go go ahead and 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 do that. And hopefully, you got some elders around you, your dad, your uncle, something like teacher to kind of help you get some skills. Uh, so that you can do that, do that successfully. So, wow, Dr. Dr. Bradley, yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you so much. This thank is thank you. This has been awesome. Sorry, Brian. Go ahead. No, no, I I agree 100. I've 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 looked around at medicine. I've seen how many doctors will tell me one thing in private and they won't say anything in public because they're afraid. It's amazing to me. I'm absolutely stunned, and I've lost a lot of respect for people because you want to fly under the radar and not say, "Hey, I'm seeing injustice," or "I'm seeing." someone being bullied and I don't say anything. And, you know, we've seen it with docs and low carb. We saw Dr. Fetke and Dr. Noakes just get totally bullied and because they were saying something different. Now it's in the ADA's guidelines, right? But they had to be called quacks and crazy and all, but they stood the fire because they knew they were the, the they were being meek and they said, okay, I'll prove my side and here we go. And I don't have to fight with everyone. And so it's a hard thing. I think is, you know, Tro and I are on different sides of the spectrum as far as aggressiveness on Twitter, maybe, but he hasn't been banned yet. How, how the hell? How the heck do you not get banned? Tro? No, no, and I, I've been and I shadow banned. No, no, no. I've been consistent. Oh, I'm shadow banned too. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm shadow banned. I'm okay with that. Whatever. I don't yes. care. But you know, but Dr. Bradley, this is really important. If you want to save our country and our young men and our young women and our families and all these things, having people like you in the community, it's it's critical. Like just to to speak truth and say, okay, I'm not just going to bow down to what the common thinking is and do the right thing. You know, I think that's the point. Is you know, sometimes you sacrifice to do the right thing. And, and it, it, it's, you know, it's a really important critical right now, more than any, any time that I know of in my lifetime. Thank you so much, Dr. Bradley. Any parting words? Thank you for having me on the show. I, I really appreciate the opportunity. I, I love the low carb community. Uh, to me, it's, it is the, the most forward thinking uh, community in, in a country connecting dots to other people aren't, aren't connecting to create a context for better, better families, better children, better relationships, better marriages, better everything. And so the, the work that you guys are doing, it's, it's a, it's a yeoman's task. And, and without you guys uh, pioneering, uh, so many people would be much, much worse off. So I am really honored to be on, on the show with you guys today. The honor's ours. How yeah. do people find you or find your books? Yeah, unfortunately, I can't hide. So you can just Google Anthony Bradley and go to Amazon. You can find my books there. Uh, Google my name and my Twitter feed will, will pop up and also probably on Instagram. So easy, easy to find, unfortunately. Awesome. All right. Listen, thank you so much, listeners. Thank you, Patreon supporters, everybody who supported this podcast. We really appreciate it and have a good day.